Prayers for the Lord's Supper will be offered at the end of the lesson. Please pause the video now and gather the needed items for this remembrance. Thank you for joining us online today at the Pace Church of Christ for this special Mother's Day sermon. The lesson today is about Abigail, a woman with both beauty and brains. The text for the day is 1 Samuel 25 verses 1 through 44. Good morning. We're very glad to have all of you here with us today and especially glad to have those of you that are moms tuning in this morning. Uh, this is your day. This is Mother's Day, a day that's been set aside to remember uh, the wonder, the joy, the blessing that our moms have given to us. And it's not just about moms. It's really about all the women in our lives whether they be our, our mothers or whether they be our wives, uh, they be our daughters, our nieces, our cousins, whatever the relationship might be, God knew that man should not be alone. And God in the garden created Eve uh, to be an equal, uh, to be a helper, to be a companion. And quite honestly, we need each other, male and female. We need each other. And the different relationships that we have with the different women in our lives ought to be blessings to all of us. So whatever the role is that you have in life, for those of you that are women, we thank you so much for all that you have given to make life better. This morning, we're going to be talking about a powerful Old Testament lady a lady who made an incredible difference in the life of David and who kept him uh, from sin. And that will be the woman we know as Abigail. And I've described Abigail in the title uh, in a way that I mean with great respect. Uh, she was a woman who had both beauty and brains. Uh, a woman that was very attractive, but also a woman that was incredibly intelligent. So as we study about her this morning and about the two men, Nabal and David, that are mentioned with her, uh, we pray that for all of us, male or female, uh, that we learn some lessons about how to be better servants in the kingdom of God. As we begin, let's bow together in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the day. And we thank you, Father, that in your wisdom and in your grace, you created us male and female. Uh, we are very much alike, and we are also very different. And you made us that way. You, you made it, us, Father, to be individuals uh, that lived in harmony with each other, that complemented each other, that brought balance to each other. And, Father, we are thankful that whatever the relationship is that we have with the different women in our lives, but we're thankful, Father, that those women are there. And we pray that in this lesson, we give honor to them. But most importantly, Father, we pray in this lesson that we give honor to you. Be with us this day, Father, and may all we say and all we do be pleasing to you. For it's in Jesus we ask. Amen. The cast of characters, 1 Samuel 25, verses 1 through 3. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. The name of the man was Nabal. The man was harsh and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. And the name of his wife, Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. As we open up to 1 Samuel 25, we're introduced to our three main characters for this chapter. Uh, the first that we're introduced to is David, who is the uh, anointed of God, the future king. Uh, he is in hiding from King Saul, who is trying to kill him. On various occasions, David has actually had the opportunity to kill King Saul, uh, but refuses to do so because Saul was chosen by God and is in that role of king. In chapter 24 and in later in chapter 26, we see at least two occasions where David had that opportunity 
uh, to remove Saul from his life. Well, David is the shepherd who will become king. Uh, but David is also a man that is driven by desire and by passion. And sometimes David can allow his temper to get in the way. But the second person that we're introduced to is Nabal. Nabal is a wealthy man who lives in Maon. He has lots of sheep, lots of goats, which is how they measured wealth back in those days. And uh, his personality is what is so unique about him, though. Uh, Nabal is a man who is known for his hostility. He is known for being mean and unkind and rude. Uh, he is the kind of person that will not show hospitality, will not show graciousness to others. As a matter of fact, his name itself means fool. The third character is Abigail, and Abigail is the one who is the uh, heroine of this story. Uh, she is the one that will save David from a terrible decision uh, that would have left him guilty of murder. So Abigail is known not only as, as Nabal's wife, but she's known for two very important qualities that are mentioned in the text. The first quality is that she is a woman of great understanding. She's a smart, smart woman, a very intelligent woman. Uh, she knows how to think. She knows how to process. She's able to analyze situations and come up with a plan of action. Uh, the, other category, the other description of Abigail that's given is she is a woman of great beauty. And it's unfortunate that we live in a time when so many people think that a woman can't be both beautiful and be smart. Uh, we tend to categorize women into one or the other of those categories. But it's quite possible for a woman to be both. And Abigail is an excellent example of that. Now, it is noteworthy that Abigail and Nabal are husband and wife. Uh, Nabal being such a crude person and Abigail being so gracious and hospitable, uh, they don't seem like the couple that ought to go together. It might have been, and this is speculation, it might have been some type of arranged marriage, which was quite common back in that day. But these are our characters, and we'll see how the interplay between these three develops throughout this story. Two hot-headed men. 1 Samuel 25, verses 10 and 12 through 13. Then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. So David's young men turned on their heels and went back, and they came and told him all these words. Then David said to his men, Every man gird on his sword. Now that we have been introduced to our cast of characters, let's look a little closer at the conflict that exists between the two men in the story. Uh, during the time that David was hiding from Saul in the wilderness, he provided protection uh, to uh, sheep owners such as uh, Nabal and kept his shepherds safe from other invaders or anything that might have harmed the flocks. Uh, the shepherds remembered that, and uh, it was sheep shearing time. So during that time, which was a, a major event during the year, uh, there was lots of food and lots of uh, enjoyment that went on. So David sent words by his young men uh, to Nabal uh, that this is what we have done for you while your, your shepherds were out in the wilderness. We protected them. And we send our greetings to you, but we ask, as is appropriate, that you provide some provisions for us since we have done such a good thing for you. Uh, the shepherds uh, certainly thought this was a, a good idea because they had been so kind uh, to the shepherds. Well, Nabal was just indignant. 
uh, he's like, who is this David and who is this son of Jesse and why should I be giving my food to those individuals that I know nothing about? David was a person who could be very well controlled but who could also have a temper. And in David's case, uh, when his servants came back and reported the attitude uh, that Nabal had had, uh, David was ready to kill Nabal and his entire household, all the men in his household. Matter of fact, the first thing David says when he finds out about the, the unkindness that Nabal had shown was to tell his troops to gather up their swords. Uh, there's about to be a, a killing taking place. Now, we all from time to time struggle with our tempers. Uh, we certainly don't want to be like uh, Nabal and be known as just a fool because we're so wicked. Uh, we don't want to be known as individuals that are unkind, uh, just plain out mean. But we don't want to be like David in this story at this point as well. We don't want to be that individual who rashly takes out an oath that we're going to bring harm or injury to some other person because they have done us wrong. Now, the wrong that was done certainly is worthy of some type of punishment. But it's not up to us as individuals, nor was it up to David in this situation, to be the one to seek that vengeance. One wise woman, 1 Samuel 25, verses 14, 18 through 19, and 23. Now, one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. Then Abigail made haste, and she said to her servants, Go on before me, see I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. When Abigail saw David, she hastened to dismount from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. It's at this point that Abigail becomes part of the story. One of the servants goes to her and tells her all that's taken place. Uh, he tells her about the protection that David and his troops had provided for them. But he also tells about the request David had made and, and Nabal's uh, inhospitable response to them. And Abigail, being a woman of, of great intelligence and great wisdom, knows that disaster is on the horizon. Uh, so she quickly puts together a plan of action and sets that plan into motion. She has her servants load up the donkeys with all kinds of foodstuffs to take to David and to his 600 troops. And she herself is going to go with this group to deliver those items. Now, the story goes on that as they approach each other, that when Abigail sees David, that she dismounts from her donkey, uh, she bows down to the ground and shows honor to David. Uh, this idea of, of bowing down, getting off one's donkey and bowing down before someone else is the idea of a lesser showing respect to one that's greater. David certainly would have taken a notice of that. So Abigail proceeds to apologize for the unkindness, the rudeness that had been done by her husband. Uh, these gifts she's brought for them to, to make up for that and to provide for that and to honor the request that David's young men had made. And Abigail at that point though, uh, uses her wisdom to show David that the path that he has chosen, a path of vengeance, of personal vengeance, is not the way that the future king of Israel needs to go. She very logically, very rationally explains to him that this just is not the kind of behavior, the kind of attitude that David ought to have. There's even a reference in there to a sling and, a, and the pocket of a sling. Uh, maybe a reference back to David and Goliath and reminding David that God has delivered you from, from bigger and more difficult situations than this. Uh, 
Don't take it upon yourself to rashly seek vengeance. Otherwise, as you become the, the future king of Israel, you enter that kingship with blood on your hands. The guilt of a murder done in vengeance. And uh, she, she admonishes him and counsels him to seek a different path. Abigail was one sharp lady. And without question, David took notice of that. Uh, her argument, her, her reasoning was sound. And, and it takes a, a, a person of, of great courage to do what she did. It also takes a person who can graciously correct somebody else. And I know it may not seem that way, but Abigail was correcting David. She was showing him the error of his thought process. Abigail's wisdom is also seen in something else. She undertook this plan of action without consulting her husband on it. Uh, it would not have taken place. It would not have gone over well. As a matter of fact, things would have gotten even worse uh, had she told him about all this. So she set out to diffuse an explosive situation created by her husband. In those times when we're dealing with explosive personalities, in those times when we're dealing with individuals who have been insulted or who have gotten their feelings hurt, uh, it's important that we show graciousness and we show hospitality and understanding. Uh, that we don't belittle them, that we don't argue with them and, and just debate with them, but that we use logic and calmness, that we use politeness and respect to make our point. And that's what makes Abigail such a strong character in the story. As a matter of fact, of the three characters, she is the one who consistently shows the most grace and the most understanding. Two different responses. 1 Samuel 25 verses 32 through 33 and verse 36. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed is your advice, and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was, holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. And therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. One of the noteworthy things about this story is the way that the two men respond to Abigail. David has listened to Abigail make her points. He realizes that he has been so rash in making this vow that he is going to kill all the men in Nabal's household. So David has calmed down. He realizes that he's wrong. And his response to Abigail is that truly it has been a blessing for God that she has come to meet him. And that she is blessed because she has prevented him from doing a horrible, horrible act. So David gives praise to her because of her wisdom. And David takes to heart uh, the lessons that he has learned from her. Nabal, on the other hand, uh, is not so open to correction. Uh, Abigail returns home, and when he gets when she gets there, uh, Nabal is in the midst of a great feast. He's full of wine, he's drunk, but he's also full of himself. And he's celebrating as if he's a king, because again, sheep shearing time of year was was a major event in their calendar. So it's not the appropriate time to speak to him because all he's thinking about is his own enjoyment. So the next morning, uh, when Nabal is awake and has sobered up, Abigail goes to him and tells him everything that's taken place. 
how that he has brought death and destruction upon himself by, by the crudeness and by the hostility that he had shown to David. And just how close to death uh, Nabal has come because of that kind of attitude. Now, many scholars think that what happens next in the story is a stroke uh, because there's an indication there of uh, some type of paralysis that sets in. And, and if it is a stroke, it greatly affects Nabal and, and leaves him um, uh, unable to function. And in a few days, he dies. So vengeance does come, but not at the hands of David. God is the one that brings vengeance. God is the one who takes care of David, as God has done on so many times. Uh, David is not guilty of murder. God, in his wisdom, is working a plan. Now, as we look at the difference between these two, the foolishness of Nabal, because he would not be open to the instruction of his wife or anyone else. Or we see the effect that she had on David and his willingness to listen to her. A happy ending, 1 Samuel 25, verse 39. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. And David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. I guess you could say that this story has a happy ending. Uh, the person who has been the villain in the story uh, gets what's coming to him. Uh, Nabal is taken out of the picture. David is protected uh, from doing something that might really disqualify him from being the king of Israel. Abigail shows the strength of, of a virtuous woman who has that same kind of wisdom that's described in Proverbs 31. But it would be great if we could say all of David's life was this way. Uh, unfortunately, David uh, would bring other women into his life other than Abigail. Uh, there would be people down the road even like Bathsheba. And David would allow his mind and his heart to wander uh, to his own pleasures. And David would reap the, the pain uh, that came from some of those choices that he would make in the future. But for now, David has listened. David has heeded the counsel of this wise woman. And as the story ends, uh, Abigail, who is now a widow, becomes David's wife. Lessons learned. Beauty and wisdom can go together. Be gracious and hospitable. God's timing is best. Satisfaction, now or later. Consider the long-term consequences. As we bring our study to a close, let's take just a few moments to make some observations, some lessons that we've learned today. First off, uh, ladies, please understand that it is okay to look good. It's okay to look nice. But what's more important is that you be a woman of wisdom. In this story, Abigail was both beautiful and intelligent. But it was her intelligence that won the day. It's like the woman again in Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, she was a, a very charming woman, but her beauty was more than just the exterior. It had to be the kind of things that came from her heart, that came from her attitude, that came from her work ethic, that came from her concern for her family and for her husband. So beauty and wisdom can go hand in hand. 
Second observation is that we should be gracious and hospitable at all times. The villain in our story was an individual who was crude and obnoxious and unkind. Abigail showed what takes place when a person with courage graciously deals with difficult situations. It was because she was both gracious and hospitable, particularly in this difficult time, that she was able to bring resolution to the problem. Thirdly, her counsel to David not to rush in to seeking vengeance, but that God had delivered him before and God would deliver him again, is a reminder that God's timing is best. We can be impatient. We can be individuals that rush in and, and try to do things our own way. But Abigail's counsel to David of waiting on the Lord, letting him fight the battles, truly is good advice. Satisfaction from that, vengeance, it's not ours to achieve. It's this desire that we have sometimes to have what we want and to have it now. We learn from the story involving, involving Abigail that sometimes what's best comes later on. And finally, it's considering the long-term consequences. Abigail realized what her husband's rudeness had brought upon their whole household. And she had to intervene so that the, the long-term damage would not be done. David learned from Abigail uh, that he had to think not just about what he wanted right now, but he had to view it in terms of what God was developing in his life. So as we look at those lessons, and as we think about what we've learned, maybe we realize that uh, we've been trying to handle everything in our own life. Maybe for some of us, we've been more like Nabal. We've been known because of our uh, unkindness, our anger, our selfishness. And people view us as being foolish and wicked. That's not the way our life needs to be. If that is the case, we need to turn and draw near to God. Or maybe we've been like David and we've allowed our temper and our rashness uh, to overtake our logic and our reason. And, and we want to get even and we want payback. God isn't pleased with that kind of behavior either. Uh, there are all kinds of vices and all kinds of evils that can be in men's hearts. The only way to have a new heart, a clean heart, is by seeking the wisdom of God, by turning to Him, by coming to Jesus Christ and allowing the blood of Jesus to create in us a new heart, to cleanse us and wash us of our sins. And that's the wonderful experience that takes place in baptism. But just like David had lapses in his life, we too can have lapses in ours. Uh, David showed wisdom at the end of this story by refraining but there are times in our life as Christians uh, where we lose our temper uh, where we're not as strong as we once were uh, that we give in to sin and to temptation it's in those occasions that we need to be lifted up before God and to ask God to forgive us once again I do pray that if there is need in your life, that today you will seek the wisdom that comes from God and that He will give you a heart that is pure. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Prayers for the Lord's Supper will be offered at the end of the lesson. Please pause the video now and gather the needed items for this remembrance.
He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. The book of Hebrews spends a great deal of time talking about the sacrificial system of the Old Testament with all its connections to the temple and the tabernacle and the priesthood. And it does so by showing how all those things pointed us toward Jesus. Jesus being the great high priest who doesn't have to offer sacrifice for himself, but offers sacrifice for us. And it's not a sacrifice that has to be offered over and over and over, but it was a sacrifice that Jesus offered once for all time. The sacrifice that completed the task. The sacrifice of His life and His blood that we might be made whole. As we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, we remember that sacrifice. We remember that it was by the death of Jesus that our salvation was obtained. It was by the shedding of His blood and the giving of His body that we were made whole and right before God. So as you partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, examine your life. Focus in on that sacrifice. Remember that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. Let's bow together as we give thanks for the bread. Father God, we thank you so much for this bread that represents the body of Jesus. We're thankful, Father, that he came to this earth to sacrifice his life for us, that we might have hope and that we might have heaven. And we pray, Father, that we will partake in a manner that's pleasing to you and that each day we will live in a manner that is pleasing to you for it's in Jesus we ask amen let's bow again as we give thanks for the cup Father God, the blood of Jesus that was shed for us is so amazing and so powerful. It can take the worst of sinners and make them white as snow. And Father, we are thankful, we are grateful that Jesus died on the cross for us. That that blood was shed. And Father, as we drink from this cup, we remember that blood. We celebrate the victory that we have from the shedding of that blood. We give thanks, Father, that that blood makes us innocent in your sight. And Father, as we partake, we give honor to Jesus for all that he has done for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We thank you again for joining us today at the Pace Church of Christ. Our next lesson will be this Wednesday, May 13th, and it will come from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. The lesson will be entitled, Knowing Christ. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you.